uh, with that, I'm delighted uh, to introduce uh, our speaker today, Akriti Agrawal with Girls Code Lincoln. And I'm going to let her tell us about her journey. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm so glad I get to speak to all of you today. Uh, I know that I might take this a little differently than most speakers. I really wanted to hear what you wanted to know about. So I'll start out by introducing myself and telling you some of the many things I'm involved in right now. Um, so my name is pronounced Akriti. It's like Socrates without the S's. Um, I don't mind if you say it wrong. So please, please feel free to address me. Um, and I have got took kind of a weird path to get here. So I went to school for actuarial science and finance and always knew I was interested in the insurance industry. Um, I came to UNL from, uh, from India and so I grew up abroad um, and came here for college. And when I graduated, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I was interested in insurance. Um, I knew I was interested in entrepreneurship. And so I ended up taking a job at a startup company um, called Jay Brash Co. So if any of you know John Brash um, and, you say, and you ever get to see him, tell him I said hi. Um, John took a chance on me and gave me my first job as a data analyst. And as part of that job, asked me to learn how to computer program. So I took about a month and taught myself how to code um, and then continued learning over the next three years while I was with him um, and working under his guidance. And so that was really amazing because I was able to learn this really cool skill that I never thought I would ever really learn and never had really considered doing. So um, that was, while I was working um, under John and learning how to code, um, I started volunteering with a local chapter of a national nonprofit called Girls Who Code. And Girls Who Code taught middle school girls how to computer program and Lincoln had started a chapter about a year prior um, to, to my starting to volunteer there. And as I started volunteering, a lot of the people that were running it um, started to have children and started to get really busy and showed interest in stepping down. So I ended up stepping up um, and ended up leading this organization and noticed a few problems with the way that we were functioning. Um, we didn't really have a lot of ownership over our brand. We didn't have any ownership over our fundraising. And when you're a nonprofit, that's problematic for numerous reasons. So um, we went through the process of founding a new board. So there were five of us that were heavy volunteers at the time, and all five of us became co-founders and turned Girls Who Code Lincoln into Girls Code Lincoln, an official 501c3 um, founded here. And so now we're, um, we've been a nonprofit for about almost three years now, um, two and a half years. We started the process about three years ago and um, it's been a really cool journey. So when I started volunteering, we had seven girls that we taught weekly how to computer program. We teach fourth to ninth grade girls um, once a week for about three hours. And we now, before the pandemic, so last March, um, we're teaching about 45 to 50 girls a week. And so a big, big growth. Um, and with a lot of growth comes a lot of challenges, obviously, as a lot of you are aware. Um, we needed a lot more volunteers. We needed a lot more funding. Um, and we needed just more space um, to teach these many children. So um, it, it was an interesting growth challenge. We applied for a lot of grants. We have a we're 100% locally funded in terms of our grants as well as our individual donors, which has been really, really cool um, to watch this community pitch in and help Girls Code Lincoln grow. Um, and we are entirely volunteer run, so we have no employees. Every single person at Girls Code Lincoln works full time in the community. Um, I work at Emeritus as, as a data governance analyst, so I work in IT, and um, each and every single one of our volunteers um, helps out whenever they can and however they can. Um, some help out every week, some help out less often. Um, we have volunteers that put in 30 to 40 hours a week into the nonprofit and we have volunteers that will put in an hour a month. So it's been really cool for people to be involved in various ways. Um, I also did want to highlight that we we're an interesting nonprofit for another reason. Um, our founding board were all under the age of 35 and had no nonprofit experience and we had very little money to start. So 
that meant that we had to find resources in some very, very odd ways. Um, we received a lot of our legal help from the University of Nebraska College of Law. They have consulting hours that they provide. Um, we did a lot of talking with business owners in the city as well as nonprofit owners in the city to figure out how we do taxes and how do we run an organization. And so um, in this last December, we actually onboarded a almost entirely new board of directors. Um, and a lot of them are names that you would be familiar with from our community. And uh, we're a 90, almost, I think, 90% female board, um, which is very unusual for boards in general, um, but really exciting for us. And we're super excited to focus on sustainability going forward and get some actual experience on our board, which we haven't had before. So yeah, um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the organization, about how we do things, about the balance of those two things. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to start us out. Yes, I got a question for you. And this is just so that I can feel impossibly old and not very smart, but uh, of the young women that you're working with, give me an example of some of the things they're capable of already as far as coding. Yes, okay. So I love this question um, because it's been really interesting watching them grow, right? I've been with this organization now for um, going on five years. Whoa, that's crazy. Um, going on five years. And so these girls have been with us for about five years, um, five or six years. And so now we're starting to see those initial seven girls. We're really starting to see the impact of our work on those girls. Um, so my favorite story to share is these, these two girls um, in our club that I love talking about, I talk about them way too often. Um, one of them had, was always had an interest in like building things, but didn't know how to code. Had never taken a computer programming class. Um, Lincoln Public Schools is one of the best schooling systems for coding in the country. Um, and still there is not a lot of, a lot of code education early on. Um, there, it's gotten a lot better over the years and they're doing amazing work over there. So um, she didn't really have any coding exposure early on and started with us when she was in middle school. So early middle school, I think in the fifth or, fifth or sixth grade, she would have started. Um, and yesterday, actually, I got contacted by her mom and she is now in high school and is, or she's, so I guess she started in elementary school. Um, she just got inducted into the um, computer science Hall, um, honor society at her high school. And so that's been really cool because she never thought computer programming was an option for her and now has made it her career path. Um, she's looking at colleges where she can learn how to code. She gets involved in a lot of different extracurriculars around the country um, where she can develop those skills. So that's been really cool. Um, my favorite story about her is our one of the first classes that I taught we were teaching them how to web development. Uh, we were teaching them how to make websites. So um, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And we were showing them how they work together. Um, when you code a website, there's the part of it that you see. But then there's the back end, which is all the code. And usually that has to be managed somewhere. Well, we decided um, early on to make things easier for our kids and to make it more fun and hands-on for them. We wouldn't show them that code management stuff at the beginning. It just was easier to not worry about it. We wanted them to see that code can be fun um, and didn't want them to get bogged down in the details. So we were using this website called Glitch that they can visualize their code. Um, so half of the screen is the code that they type and the other half automatically refreshes to show them their website that they're creating. And we had a lot of conversations on the back end, you know, how practical is this? Can they really use this to make a website? And we said, you know, they'll level up and we'll teach them code management after, but we have to get them interested first. Um, well, this girl, her name's Darian. Darian took these skills that she had learned and went back to her family. And I guess her family over dinner sometime was talking about um, creating a website for a vacation home, a vacation home that they own um, for renting it out. And she was able to convince her parents to let her design it. Um, and she was able to convince her parents to pay her for it. She knew that was a marketable skill 
And <laughs> Darian in middle school knew that this is a skill I can charge for, and here is what I would like to charge for it. And so she knew her worth. She knew how to negotiate skills that we didn't teach her. Um, we taught her how to be confident about the work she was doing. And um, she made them a website. And then they asked for a Google Maps add-in to the website. And she knew that that was another thing that she could charge consulting hours for. So she did. Um, and we do an end of the semester party um, every, at the end of every semester, we do like an ice cream party so that the girls can show off their work to their families and um, interact with their friends at the party. And her dad comes very proudly to me showing me this website that Darian created um, through Glitch. So he had a really long URL that she used a tiny URL thing so that he could get to it easier. And um, she earned a nice amount of money to do that. <laughs> And so, yeah, it's it's been really cool to see that the kids have so much, they, they're, they're so smart and they absorb things like a sponge. And I don't think that when I was that young, I would have done that. And I don't think that when I was a kid, I would have chosen to be at a coding club on a, sat, on a Sunday. But all of our kids love being there. They love being in the space. They love interacting with each other. Um, one of our girls said that, she likes coding club more than chess club, which for her was a really high state. I don't know chess. So um, she absolutely loves chess and she loves coding more. And it's been really cool to give them this opportunity and to show them that this is an area that's made for them as much as it's made for the boys, because I didn't think that when I was a kid. And so it's been cool to fill that gap. Um, our most advanced girls, when we left off in March, were doing machine learning in a language called Python, um, where they could point a camera at the space and it would say things like, this is a restaurant. Um, and it blew my mind because I, I'm a computer programmer and I don't know how to do that. And so they, they get very advanced very quickly. Um, the advanced girls are now beyond what I know. So I don't teach them anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, there is a lot of potential there and they do pick things up a lot faster than I think I did. Excellent, other questions? So Akriti, since you've, they're advancing beyond you, have you or are you in the process of setting up the next level for them to be able to pass them off to? Yeah, so we, um, we're constantly recruiting for volunteers and we write all of our own curriculum in-house so um, our volunteers work with the kids and figure out what they want to learn. Um, and the girls actually choose their own curriculum every semester. So um, we'll sit down with them and we have, we split them up into three groups at the moment um, with our current set where there's a beginner group. So they do one semester of beginner and that's where they learn the basics of computer programming. Um, and they learn about why tech is for them, why they're welcome here. Um, those types of things, the history of women in STEM. Um, then they go into web development. And during web development, the first day, we'll ask them what they want to learn. Um, and then we as volunteers will go back and figure out how to get how to do that. So um, one semester I was teaching, one of the girls asked to learn how to make BuzzFeed style quizzes. So that was my job to go learn how to make BuzzFeed style quizzes or find someone that knew how to do it um, so that we could do that for the kids. And then the advanced girls are basically writing their own stuff at this point. So they um, are completely creating their own path. We'll, we'll get them a few volunteers that have varying skill sets and they'll come volunteer with the, our advanced girls and they'll just talk about what they wanna do and they'll run with it. So we really do depend on um, advanced volunteers, um, varying levels of coding volunteers to write that curriculum to cater to the girls. And the th some of the things that we've learned in that process are um, girls don't think STEM is for them. They don't think coding is for them unless they can either see social impact with their work or they can see that it's fun. So um, almost all of our curriculum is cat themed um, because our first set of girls really loved cats and that seems to have carried forward and through this whole time. Um, one of our volunteers once wrote a, a piece of curriculum about dogs and it did not go well. So we've, we've kind of made it our like mission now that everything is about cats. 
Um, we have hidden cats in all of our marketing materials that our girls know that they can go find. Um, so it's, it's been interesting doing that. And then the other side of it is the social impact. So asking them how they can take these skills and apply them elsewhere um, to benefit our society. And so the girls know that um, Girls Code Lincoln is successful and available to them because of the community and they really wanna give back. So creating opportunities where they can learn about what's happening in our community is very important. Other questions for Akriti. This is great stuff. Um, if any of us has a daughter or a granddaughter that is intrigued by the, or, or, or might be a possibility of, uh, for joining your group, well, how do we get them connected with you? Yeah, so I'll drop our email in the chat. Um, right now we're not doing in-person clubs because of COVID. Um, and I'm honestly not sure when we'll be back to in-person clubs. We work out of a co-working space and we are fully volunteer based and we teach quite a bit, quite a few kids at a time. So we're trying to make sure everyone is safe, but we are doing a virtual speaker series. So kind of like this, we'll have kids jump on. It's open to boys and girls anywhere in the country, um, anywhere in the world to jump on. And we have STEM um, speakers, um, science, technology, engineering, math, but we've also added arts and entrepreneurship. Um, we only have women speak. That it's, representation is very important. And they come from all over the country to talk to our girls um, virtually. So we have a Zoom call, any kid can join. And then um, we also record it. So those are also available on Zoom, uh, on YouTube for them to watch later if they can't join live. Um, and they're kind of like, like what I'm trying to do with this, where the speaker will talk about themselves for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then the girls ask questions. So they're, they're able to cater the conversation to what the girls are interested in. Um, we had Angela from Goldenrod Pastries speak last semester, um, Elizabeth Elspeth Magleton from the Space Law Department at UNL spoke. Um, we had um, an animator from DreamWorks Animation speak. So we've been getting some really cool speakers and we're hoping to continue that. Um, so that is a really, really cool thing that some of them might be interested in. Um, and if you email us at that email address, we can add you to our email list for that or for when clubs reopen. Um, we take applications usually once a year for our regular session. And then we also do workshops. So um, if if the kids are local, um, they can come to a workshop. They're usually um, anywhere between two to five hours. Um, they're a one-time thing instead of a weekly um, engagement. And they are like mini projects that the kids will work on. And we usually work with community partners to do those. So we've done one at the Bay where we've worked with Pixel Bakery and done like a creative workshop. Um, we've worked with Zillow Group and done a Harry Potter um, wand coding workshop. Um, we've done our, our in-house workshop is we make little hats that have lights sewn into them and we teach them how to code the lights. So yeah, multiple ways to get involved. If you'd like to get on our email list, just shoot us an email and we can do that. Very good. Other questions? What do you see as next for you in terms of your vision and gifts and experience going forward? Yeah, um, that's a tough question to answer, John. I don't know. Um, Sorry about I, that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Um, I love being with Girls Code. And it's. I think there's a lot of value in the way that we operate where all of our volunteers are also members of the community. Um, I think that brings a lot of fresh ideas into our organization. Um, it brings a lot of different perspectives. And so I'm really excited to see that grow um, going forward. As a founder, it's I, some of you might relate to this. My goal is that we grow to a point where I can leave it and I know that it will sustain and it will be awesome without me. Um, and having this new board of directors of people that know what they're doing and know how things work is a huge step forward in that direction. Um, that, that was the premise of my question because with, as it grows and goes forward, you need to succession it on to the next group of leaders. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for um, some of our girls that are currently advanced girls to become volunteers with us. 
as we go forward. Um, we have a lot of, we get a lot of volunteers also from uh, the university. And so um, I'm excited for some of them to stay in town and want to take leadership in our organization. But I think for me, um, my goal is over the next few years, you know, grow to a point where it can do awesomely without me and continue growing. And then um, I don't, I don't know. I, I kind of go where my career takes me. So right now Emeritus is awesome and they've been a great employer for me um, and are really supportive of my nonprofit, which is very important to me. So that's been really, really nice. And I'm excited to see where that goes. Awesome. Yeah, it's a, the double-edged sword of being a founder is so fascinating um, where you want it to get to a point where you can leave it, but that's also a very odd thing to say and a very um, odd thing to talk to people about if they don't quite understand what that feels like. Entrepreneurs don't like to give up their baby. <laughs> yeah, and Girls Code is my baby, right? It's, exactly. It's been, it's been, this is what I call my life's work. Um, exactly. and. I know I'm only 26, but like this, this is the thing I'm the most proud of. Other questions out there? Hakriti, so there's nothing on the horizon that might be piquing your interest that after this one is, you know, passed off into very capable hands that maybe something else is just, you know, kind of tickling in the back of your mind that you might be considering? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, That's two in a row. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, I never thought that I would found a nonprofit. You know, I never, my, when I was in college, I, so my like life goal is to, and this is why I said, like, I always kind of dabbled in entrepreneurship. My life goal was to start a nonprofit insurance company. And I decided that when I was in the eighth grade. Really? But I, I said I was going to do it when I was 50. Like, it, this was going to be my retirement. Um, I was going to have a full career in insurance, and then I would go and do this thing on the side. And that, that, was, that was my goal. And so it's, I never planned to take over a nonprofit. I never planned to found one. I don't really know how this happened. Um, and so I don't, I've never really thought about doing another one because that, the like life goal nonprofit is so far away from me still. Um, I am currently working on a master's degree in business and I'm doing it online from the University of Nebraska Lincoln and they have a significant number of courses in nonprofit management. And that's been really interesting because I do see myself staying in the nonprofit space um, long term. I'm on a few different boards um, of nonprofits locally and so I'm excited to see those through and take some of these skills that I've learned from Girls Code Lincoln and help other organizations build up as well. Um, so I think I'll do that for a while. Um, I would like to say that I would take a break, but like probably many of you, I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see, Jody. you'll have to keep up. <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> Well, if there's one thing I've learned about entrepreneurs is they've always got a thousand ideas that uh, percolating that they would like to pursue. And I'm sure you're that way. Are there any other yeah, questions? Yeah, question. Um, so um, uh, as far as how you um, choose projects or curriculum for the kids that, you know, you, you talked about how uh, uh, you know, in order to um, keep people engaged, you, you know, either made it, you know, fun or about uh, social impact. I guess maybe first part of the question is, you know, how did you discover or decide that those were kind of like the areas that, you know, were more engaging and then, you know, be, you know, within, the, within those, you know, how do you choose topics that, um, you know, are, are going to be engaging, so. Yeah, great question. Um, so I think how we got to that was definitely trial and error. Um, I, I remember, when I was teaching. So when I first took over, I was teaching the club as well as running the org. Um, and I had just taught myself how to code. So obviously I wasn't advanced by any means, um, but neither were the girls. So as long as I stayed a lesson ahead of them, I was fine <laughs> is, is what I convinced myself. Um, and I had great volunteers that helped write the curriculum, but we would come to club with all of this curriculum written out. And we'd say, here's what we're gonna do today. 
And then one of the girls would say, okay, but how do I make my background rainbow colored? And then the whole class is derailed. Or one of the girls would say, okay, I just want like a gif of a cat, like in the back, or can I add a video? Um, and now we've like taken this entire piece of curriculum that we wrote and it's useless because we lost them. Um, they get two hours to code and we spent an hour and a half of it looking at colors online. So I think that's how, that's how we first discovered that it needed to be fun. Um, and the definition of fun is based on the girls and the group. So that's why we needed them to guide us. Um, one of the first things we tell our volunteers that write curriculum is don't get married to your curriculum. Um, you will walk into club teaching that curriculum. And in the first 10 minutes, those girls will do completely derail you. Um, but that's good. We want the girls to think of ideas and we want, you know, Gordon, you're a coder, you know this, like it's so much ideas and it's so much Googling things where the tech world is changing every single minute and we can't keep up. Um, so when they think of an idea, it's okay for us to sit there and Google that together and for us to go through the problem solving pathway. Um, we know that most of our girls aren't going to become computer programmers. It's the statistics just aren't on our side for that, but we want them to know that that's an option for them. And we want them to know that they can do whatever they want, including code, anything, they can do anything. Um, and so the code is a way to teach them how to problem solve, not the other way around. So we don't really focus on the language. We don't really focus on the curriculum. We focus on the problem solving of it. Um, my best example for that is we have, so we have a teacher at the front of class and we'll have um, 10 to 15 kids um, sitting down on individual laptops. And then we have about five to seven volunteers at any given time standing around at club. We call them facilitators. And we ask that our facilitators are a combination of people that know how to code and people that have never seen code before, um, which seems very counterintuitive. But there's a, there's a different way that somebody who doesn't know how to code will answer a coding question. Because they don't know how to code, they would have gone through the same lesson that the girl, girls would have gone through. And then they will go through problem solving. Usually in code, the issues are spelling, punctuation, which we can look at together and we can work through. Or they'll go through the other side of problem solving where either they'll ask somebody around them. So now we're showing them that you can collaborate, you can work together and problem solve, um, explain the issue. Or they'll go to Google and they'll try and figure out the answer. Um, which is what we do in our real jobs. So it, it is, it, it's interesting how um, the curriculum changes on a daily basis, just during club, and how the girls guide the curriculum in a lot more ways than they probably realize, um, just because they derail us so often. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how we landed on it, how it needed to be fun and needed to be driven by the girls. I mean, um, so I guess, I guess two pieces. So I mean, so one is, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I guess kind of what you're describing is, is maybe more of an adult way of learning that, you know, you have the problem and then I'll just like say, okay, well now what are all the things I need to learn in order to, how to solve that problem? You know, as opposed to like, here's a book and memorize it. And then now you can like do some more things. Um, exactly. so, um, but then, you know, it seems like then that what you're describing is, okay, well, so you came up with something with, they had lots of cats in it, but you know, maybe your next cohort is going to not be so engaged with that because they're different kids. And so, but it sounds like you have something, you know, kind of flexible built into it that, uh, or, or, or some degree of give built into it that uh, uh, if they want to take it off into a different direction, you know, color selection or whatever, I don't know, uh, then, yeah. uh, 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 then that's perfectly fine too, because like they're learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the other side of that is that also keeps our, our teachers engaged. So that keeps our teachers and our volunteers really engaged. And I think that's why people like teaching club um, because it's a significant amount of work to, to write curriculum and to teach that curriculum to a bunch of kids on a Sunday, right? But we keep people coming back because club is different every single time, even if you're teaching the same curriculum. Um, you're trying to teach the same skills, but the kids change it every single time. The nonprofit like volunteer engagement is a big deal. So if I can keep my volunteers engaged, that's awesome for me. 
the Aquati, are you planning on expanding this program to other cities? Because this is such an amazing, brilliant program that it needs to be expanded, whether under you, which might be your next project, but I mean, to engage girls at that, to make their brains start working for themselves and whatnot, this is huge. Thanks, Jody. Yeah, I think we're, we, we're onto something cool here, but I will say a lot of other cities have similar things. They're run very differently. Um, there, so there is Girls Who Code, which is a national organization. There's Girls Who Code chapters all over the country and in many parts of the world. Um, but Girls Who Code runs more on the, what I call the Girl Scout model, where the teacher doesn't necessarily know the content. So somebody who doesn't know how to code can go in and with this curriculum that Girls Who Code has developed and teach it. Um, we used to do that too, right? That's how we started out. But we found a lot of our volunteers had that skill set and wanted the fun of like changing the curriculum. They wanted to write their own curriculum. They didn't want to work with this thing they were given, um, which is how we kind of landed on this. Um, we have been asked before if we will expand. And this is something that comes up pretty often. Um, there, there have been Girls Who Code chapters around the country that have thought about becoming their own um, nonprofit. And I'm in a, quite a few nonprofit groups or um, like Facebook groups and stuff like that in both the nonprofit and the for-profit space. And so we provide, like we try and help out whenever we can. Um, we share our curriculum with anyone who wants it. We are happy to help bridge that however we can. Um, we're actually helping out a local nonprofit right now in Lincoln that's trying to form into a nonprofit. They're in the art space and they're having, um, they wanted some advice on how we did it. So we are all like all hands on deck helping out. Um, so we love doing that kinds of stuff. But I think the reason we work is because of Lincoln. And I, I don't know if I could, like not being a member of a different community, I don't think I could take that and replicate it even somewhere like Omaha. Um, and the reason I say that is because we partner with a lot of different local Lincoln organizations. We um, have all of our donors are local, all of our grants are local, all of our volunteers are local. Um, there has to be some sense of like the network in the community that is willing to back you. Um, the day that Lincoln decides Girls Code Lincoln is no longer needed, Girls Code Lincoln will die. Um, and so it is the community that keeps it alive um, and keeps it thriving. And so I don't know if you could replicate this model somewhere else unless you had somebody else or another set of like five co-founders, right, that are members of the community and are involved in the community and have those connections. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Akriti, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for everything you're doing in our community uh, to further the cause. Uh, Please, everyone, uh, reach out to your daughters, your uh, nieces, your granddaughters. Uh, and if you think they would have any interest in this group, have them watch the video uh, and then they can make their decision or have them visit their website. They've got a really cool website that I imagine probably one of their students did and uh, support them. And I'm sure uh, if people feel so moved, how can we... Uh, how do we get a hold of you to donate? Yes, so there is a donation button on our website. Um, we have Give to Lincoln Day coming up. So if you do donate during Give to Lincoln Day, please consider donating to us. Um, but any other time of the year, um, visit us at girlscodelincoln.com. We also have a Facebook page if you'd like to keep up that way. Um, with all that we've been doing, we post more on there. We've we'll be posting about all of our speaker series. And I, that um, YouTube, that Zoom speaker series that we're doing right now during COVID, it's called Empower Her. So like empower, but H-E-R at the end. The links for that are on our YouTube page, or you can email me and I can send them to you. Um, but we also encourage you to get boys to come to that. Um, it's important for boys to hear how women are making a difference in STEM and for them, for us to normalize women being in these fields. So yes, we're well, anybody is welcome to come to that. Um, and that way you can hear more about what we're doing as well. But I really appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to hear from me. 
Well, thank you so much. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your presence. Uh, and again, I, I hope that you'll join us next week for Janine Bryant with Changing Spaces. She'll talk about her new book and also about her dynamic growing Lincoln business. So join us next week and uh, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you for being here.